Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. My name is Chris Spangle. It's so great to be with you. And uh, first and foremost, thank you to everyone who is a Wall Plus member. Make sure you check out all the benefits of being a Wall Plus member at joinwallplus.com. That is W A L, as in We Are Libertarians for the network. So go check that out. Um, this is a show that I've wanted to do for a while. And, uh, you know, Vaughn. We're like best friends. I talk to you every day. I have no idea how to say your last name. Sparger? Sparger. Sparger. Okay. Uh, so Lars and Jake and all the Patreon members that I get wrong. <laughs> it's not just you. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot lately about first principles. And I think one of the reasons that I am maybe different than other libertarian voices is my Christianity. And I don't talk a lot about it because I don't, you know, I know that people get, they get uncomfortable when you start talking about religion and especially Christian religions because of Christian nationalism, which we're going to talk about in an upcoming episode. And, you know, millennials have kind of been scarred Vaughn by the, the previous generation using Christianity to force a lot of things literally force a lot of things down uh, other people's throats. And, um, you know, when I look at my politics, it's largely informed by my religion. It's, you know, we're going to do a show on dignity, and this show is going to be talking about mercy. We're going to talk about forgiveness. We're going to talk about a lot of these foundational Christian concepts that I think are really tied to and important in Christianity and how they may apply to politics today. And this has been on my mind a lot because, um, you know, I'm, I'm on the Pat Down. It's a great podcast, hilarious podcast, talking a lot about racial reconciliation, but mostly it's a comedy show. And, you know, I was in the Tea Party and I look back at a lot of, you know, m where I started to where I'm at now. And I'm a much, much different person, uh, it, different now than I was a month ago, different now than I was 20 years ago, different now than I was 10 years ago. And there are people in that audience that can't get over that I was in the Tea Party and basically act like I was in the Proud Boys. <laughs> and they have ab absolutely no idea what the Tea Party was or why I was in it. They don't care. They just would want to call me a white supremacist. And there's no acknowledgement of the effort that I have made, the discomfort that you goes into having conversations with people that you don't understand, that are directly opposed to you, that it's not easy to talk about politics or religion or race or some of these big issues. It's just, I don't want to have to deal with your worldview, so I'm just going to call you a name. Like, there's no mercy there, right? You know, and for the other side, there there isn't... You, you know, you're on the right, for instance, and you're a Trump person, you have no mercy for the bulwark guy. You know, if you're, yeah. if you're in the libertarian movement and you're uh, an anarchist, you have no mercy or grace for the Mises guy, right? Like it, in Christianity, if you're Mormon, you know, well, let's, let's say if you're Baptist, then you have no mercy for the Mormon guy, right? <laughs> I, we, we separate ourselves into these groups and manage to dehumanize each other so often. And that is like the root of the cause. And so I've been thinking a lot about the antidote to it. And that seems to me to be mercy. And yeah. so like, can you define mercy? Can you, can you explain now? We should also probably explain who you are. What do you do for a living? Who are you? Well, and tell us why you're here. Well, my name is Vaughn Sparger. I'm an associate pastor in a Baptist church. Um, and frankly, studying the history of my faith, my doctrine, you know, a lot of people, they are what they are because of who their parents are. They're the religion they are because that's what their parents are. They're in the church they are because that's what their parents are. And I was raised a Baptist. But when I was in seminary studying Baptist history, I realized, whoa, whoa. The more I learn about Baptist history, the more I realize I really am a Baptist. <laughs> and the more I studied it, the more it led me to libertarianism. Hmm. And the thing that you were talking about, mercy, mercy in a biblical definition is what we call unmerited favor. It means giving people what they don't deserve. 
That's the most basic definition that I can come up with mercy is unmerited favor. And so we as Christians, especially are called to be merciful to those around us, to show mercy to everyone, even when they don't deserve it. Yeah, I feel like there is a lot of, um, let's, let's say this, mercy seems to be instrumental in de-escalation, which is yeah. what we desperately need at this moment. Mm -hmm. And you can't ask other people to give you mercy. It doesn't work that way. It's about you. It's about individuals. We, we can't just expect other people to forgive. We have to take that first step. Someone has to de-escalate. Um, I know I dropped it in the chat a couple, about a week ago, a podcast I listened to, Hipstery Impossible with Alex von Sternberger, his pandemic episode. Well, what does the pandemic have to do with it? Well, his thesis was ultimately that the pandemic led to fear. And the fear created a cycle of fear in Germany between the communists and the fascists that ultimately led to Hitler taking over. Because that fear just kept ratcheting up and ratcheting up, just like the Hatfields and McCoys fighting each other. One person kills someone, so then I got to go kill them, and then they got to kill someone in my family, and I got to kill someone in their family. Someone's got to take that first step to ratchet it down. And that should be the people who claim to love peace, who claim to be about nonviolence, whether Christians or libertarians, we both claim that peace and nonviolence are the way that we believe. So we need to act on that. Yeah, I would say Muslims, Jews as well. I mean, most yeah. faiths emphasize well, I'm just going peace. off my personal, you know, sure. those are the two parts of me and, and you as well. And libertarians, especially, we claim to believe in the non-aggression principle. Well, the non-aggression principle only works if someone's willing to back down, if someone's willing to say, you know what, I'm going to give them mercy. I'm not going to try to exact vengeance upon them. That was an important part of why the rule of law developed. So if you go back to the yeah. history of England, for instance, and you look at how England was ruled, it was ruled by clans, basically, and it was operating under a system of blood feuds. And so it was a, you know, one clan would have a claim against another and they'd go and kill that person, it, much like the Hatfields and McCoys. You kill one of ours, we'll kill two of yours. Think of, you know, mob wars. I mean, that's, that is, yeah. that is just that same mentality, Antifa versus Proud Boys. It's just yeah. blood feuds, basically. Mm -hmm. And it lasted for hundreds of years until Alfred came along and said, we need a system of laws to end the blood feuds. We need to set some rules. We need to set the boundaries. And that's how the rule of law started to develop. Now, eventually it became the rule of monarchs. And then, you know, I had to break it apart with constitutions and English bills of rights and declarations of independence and all that. But um, it sometimes feels like we are slipping back into that same old mentality of blood feuds. Yeah. It doesn't matter what I do to the other side because they've done this to me. Yeah. And part of it is because there is an inconsistency in the way the law is applied. The entire purpose of the rule of law was that everybody was treated the same. It works when that happens, but when people, but when we have such injustice going on and some people seem to get away with things that other people aren't, it creates resentments and bitterness. And it's hard to let go of those things. Now you're talking about people being kicked off of Twitter. Is that what you mean? <laughs> no, I'm not talking about people being kicked off of Twitter. Yeah, I think there. you look at the people getting pardons from Trump. They're the people who paid $100,000 to $2 million, and they're getting yeah. pardons to get heard, to have, like, John Kirikow, who I've met, yeah. great guy, uh, paid 50 grand to have his pardon heard, and then 50 grand if it got licensed so he could get a $700,000 pension. If you're... If you're economically disadvantaged, you don't have that luxury. Well, that's, I mean, that, that's one area in which Trump is just like every other president before him in at least recent history that we can think of. I mean, they all do that. They all, at the end of their presidency, issue a bunch of pardons for all their friends and politically connected people and people who can do them favors. Yeah. So let's apply this to, to interpersonal because I, I feel like it's, it's less about the politics and more about how we interact with each other and, yeah. and then politics will follow culture. Well, mercy, mercy is about individuals. In what way? Well, 
part of the problem, I mean, we, t we talk about this a lot in the group chat, but the other, mm -hmm. it's hard to have mercy. It's hard to feel empathy for just a nameless blob of in people that you don't see as people. You just see them as the other, the liberals, the left, the commies, the MAGA. Yeah. Q whoever. Anon, right. Yeah. The QAnon, the MAGA. We, we, they're just this nameless blob that we ascribe all of everything we hate to them. And the truth is, there's a lot of similarities between us. Everybody, I mean, you, you get anybody in a room with you, just you and them, you can probably find something you have in common. Yeah. I tried to do this with journalists because I found myself kind of, you know, I'm attracted to journalists. I always wanted to be a journalist and I found myself kind of buying into the evil media they're the mm. the enemy of the people journalists journalists you know and so I, i've really kind of made a point of trying to reach out to journalists and talk to them and you know privately and yeah. why do you think the way that you do you know just to get a better understanding of where they're coming from reading a couple books on journalists like that like an up-and-coming journalist that would you know it's like that's one way that I've tried to institute mercy. Like as you're going about your day, what are some other ways that people, other than just trying to understand the people that you don't want to understand, what are some other ways to exercise mercy? Well, you know, we can't be, feel empathy for every single person in this world. It's just too much for one person. And so one thing we can think about, you know, you go back to the, the Christianity and Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan when one of the when jesus gives the he, he's asked what is the greatest commandment and he says thou shalt love the lord thy god with all thy heart and the second is like unto it thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself well someone asks him well who's your neighbor and then he tells this story of this man who is walking down the road gets beset upon by a bunch of robbers gets beat up within an inch of his life and left for dead and a, a couple of super religious people walk by they ignore him because they got more important things to do and then another man walks by samaritan and i won't get into all the context of that but he helps the man that had been beaten up he helps him and he had no reason to the Samar the man who was hurt on the road was jewish this was a samaritan there was a lot of bad blood between these two groups of people they hated each other and there would be excommunication and alienation if he did help the, the yeah. jewish man but he still helped him he picked him up, he took him to a hotel or a, a inn, paid for his room and board, paid for the medicine to take care of him. And at the end, Jesus asked the man who asked him, who's thy neighbor? Well, who was his neighbor? And he said, well, the Samaritan. And the point of that story is that your neighbor is who is in your life. We get so focused on all these crimes and all these things that are happening completely outside of where we live, of the people we talk to. We're worried about something that's happening in California and we're in Indiana or we're in Ohio. Stuff that's happening to people we don't even know and we get angry and, and sent. Well, stop worrying about that stuff. Start focusing on the people that you know. Start reaching out to them. Start showing them love. Start showing them mercy. Because, you know, when your brother does something mean to you, if you have a good relationship with them, I'm not going to say everybody does, but you show them mercy. Hate that rat bastard. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Va Vaughn's a cool pastor because we curse in front of him and, and post to horrible means and he just doesn't say anything. So, <laughs> no, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I, I struggle with willful ignorance. I, I don't suffer fools well. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, oh, trust me. I know exactly what you're talking about there. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard. And I, you know, it's for like, you know, and I get it from both sides because of these two audiences. I get the willful ignorance for the right and the willful ignorance from the left. And <laughs> like, I find that I just want to be understood. You know, it's yeah. like when I'm talking to these various groups, it's like, I don't, like, I just want you to understand where I'm coming from and I want you to understand my perspective. And I'm so busy trying to get that across to some people that I forget that I need to listen to their experience. Yes. Yeah. Well, because, you know, we can't, I can't affect you. I can't make you listen to me. I can't make you do what I want you to do. I can't make you be nice. I can't make you forgive me. The only person I can affect is myself. Right. And so 
it doesn't matter what's going on out in the world. It doesn't matter what everyone else is doing. That doesn't excuse me from doing what I need to do. Which is? Which is showing people love and mercy, which is treating people with respect as individuals, even if I disagree with them, even if I disagree with the way they live their life, even if I disagree with the choices they've made, I still need to treat them with the love that Jesus showed to everyone, but also just treat them with the respect of being an individual and not otherizing them into a nameless, faceless mob so I can hate them. I think that's easy if you're talking to a cashier or you're talking to a waitress or an uncle or Mm -hmm. uh, a cousin or whatever. Even if you may disagree, it's easy when you're kind of sitting across from somebody. Yeah. But like go online and say that you think that Joe Biden is a nice man. (laughs) <laughs> well he's a war criminal and he is <laughs> but how, how do we extend that to political figures and journalists and people that like like i have contempt for jim acosta yeah. I mean, how, how how can we extend that to you know it, it, you're right it is interpersonal but how can we extend some of that thinking to um politicians and journalists and and other people that w- that we may have a disagreement with and genuine moral disagreements with somebody like for instance like a joe biden who voted for iraq yeah it's hard and one of the issues with the internet is it makes us we we don't have all those social cues we don't realize how things are plus certain things just don't come across the same you know sarcasm doesn't work as well online as it does in person right because you don't know the person but we just, we have to learn. And, and this is something, you know, we're all learning how to use the internet. This is brand new. Right. I mean, go look back, go look in history, study what happened when the Gutenberg press was first came out. There were lots of wars. Yeah. And we're still learning the rules, but we need to start learning ourselves how to show mercy and exhibit what we want. You know, we, we say we want, we say we believe in the free market of ideas, the free market, that individuals working together, individuals even, you know, trading, working together is more efficient and more effective than the government can ever be. So why aren't we living that? So you mentioned the Reformation, I mean, you mentioned the Gutenberg, and yeah. the, the, the printing press, let's call it. Yeah. And the Reformation was just nurtured on the printing press. Yes, it was. Do you feel like there is an increase, and I know this sounds weird, but sometimes I think there's an increase in empathy and uh, a respect for people and a dignity and that society in some ways is is becoming more merciful because we are exposed to more stories. I think, or- oh, yeah, I do think that is happening because part of what we're seeing is a pendulum swing where you you get, we're moving in a certain direction but people who don't like that are fighting against it. You know, mm. one of the most dangerous times when you're in a battle or in a when you're hunting is dealing with a dangered enemy who knows they're losing. Mm. Especially if they feel like there's no hope. When you've got someone who's losing and they feel like they don't have any hope, that's when they become the da- most dangerous. That's when they lash out. That's when they get angry. That's when they do the crazy things. That's why I'm a little bit worried about what's going to happen when Biden becomes president, because there's a lot of people out there believing the lies about QAnon that Trump is going to somehow magically take over. And when that doesn't happen, there's going to be a lot of shattered people. I I genuinely agree with you. I think people don't like to be made a fool of. And I think they're starting to figure out that he's made a fool of them and that he isn't real and that, I mean... People worry about Joe Biden's safety. I'm wondering, like, what's going to happen to the Trumps? <laughs> you know, yeah. when, when a lot of these people really believed in the in that 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 bubble collapses. Yeah. Well, I'm 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 worried about. But I'm also worried about them. I mean, because that's going to affect not just them. It's going to affect their families. Yeah. It's going to affect their kids. Just the, that article I just dropped in the chat about that father, who literally told his children and I, I guarantee you that in the past this is someone who talks about family values told his children if you tell the police i went to washington dc i'm going to put a bullet in your head because that's what um 
traitors deserve. Right. And if you that one of the sons said, I love him, but I hate him. I hate what he's become. I hate what Trump has turned him into. So how, how do you deal with, if you're the son, how do you yeah. deal with that? Because part of why I wanted to have this discussion is when that bubble bursts, yeah, those people have to come back to reality, mm -hmm. you know, and how do you start to, there's going to be a lot of people who go, you, you acted really ugly for five years and I don't yeah. want to be a part of you. And alienation is part of what's making a lot of these folks violent. They're looking for connection and meaning. Yeah. And they're not finding it because people are rightly cutting people that have yeah. no boundaries out and of their life. But how, how do you recognize a changed heart and show mercy to people? Well, you've got to have boundaries. And what I mean by that is, you know, th this is something we wanted to talk about is what is true forgiveness? Because right now you've got a lot of people saying, let's get unity, let's get unity, but they refuse to admit what they've done wrong. Right. And if they can't even admit what they've done wrong, there's no chance at unity. But that doesn't mean I shouldn't still be reaching out to them, but I also shouldn't allow them to victimize me again. You know, one of the biggest problems you see in many churches is they expect women who are being abused by their husbands to stay in that marriage or to even reconcile with the husband with no boundaries, with no way to keep the husband, to force the husband to treat the woman correctly. Right. And, you know, um, it might surprise some people, me being a pastor, I do listen to the pat down and there's some very interesting things. She talks about how she forgave the people who did some incredibly horrendous things to her, not for their sake, but for her sake. But right. that doesn't mean she's letting them back in her life. Right. Because forgiveness isn't the same thing. There's got to be boundaries. And the person has to show true contrition, especially in families when there's abuse or anything like that. You've got to say, you know, you've got to make sure they know it's not just, oh, I'm sorry, let's go back to the way things are. Well, you can't go back to the way things were. That's not what forgiveness means. Forgive this means I'm not holding it against you, but I'm still going to expect you to, um, I'm going to still expect you to, I'm not going to forget it. I'm not going to just forget what you did. Yeah. I mean, the Good Samaritan story, there's a great book called Boundaries and in it, they talk about the Good Samaritan and, and he took the the injured Jewish man to, to a hospital and left him there and then went on his journey back to where he was going he didn't stay there for four weeks nurturing the man back to health like he didn't let he didn't divert all of his life and yeah. rearrange it for the hurting man he he still had he did what he could in the moment and then moved on with his life and i you know and that was an important note for me because i you know was very codependent you know especially after my divorce and uh you know, in this context, I think we look at people who have, who generally act terrible, and I'm not talking about just people and political persuasions and, and all mm -hmm. that. I'm talking about in life. And we're, we're hesitant to give consequences. Yeah. You, your, your uncle that believes horrible things or says horrible things will sit there and just kind of be quiet to keep the mm -hmm. peace. Yeah. You know, or we know something is happening in this household, but we don't have evidence. So we don't know what to do or it, it's not our place to say something. You know, where is the line between enablement and and how do you apply consequences? I mean, I don't know if the question makes total sense, but I think an important part of mercy is showing mercy when somebody's ready to be contrite. Mm -hmm. but not just showing mercy time and time. I, I, am I making sense? Like, yeah. And like, I, I guess, let me, let me illustrate it with the politics situation, mm -hmm. right? Like Trump has acted horribly. Yeah. Unlike Richard Nixon, who resigned and took responsibility and said, I'm sorry. Trump has absolutely no contrition whatsoever. And he's done, mm -hmm. he's done something worse yeah. than Watergate. And he still doesn't feel contrite. 
and now he's been impeached and the Senate has to hold a trial and they have, and now there's conversations about putting him in jail and Mm -hmm. holding him accountable for the things that he's done. And in my mind, there should be consequences. But at the same time, if there are stern consequences for this man or for the people that have followed him, there's a very real chance of that backfiring in the pu- in the public, right? Like so, yeah. If you it, don't it, apply the consequences, then things never change because they didn't apply it to Nixon, and things didn't change, even though he was contrite. But at the same time, like if we don't show some mercy to some of these folks, then how do they break out of this mindset? Yeah. Well, part of showing mercy, showing mercy doesn't mean letting them get away with doing wrong. What it does mean is not rubbing the salt in their wounds about it. So don't Mm. remind them every time you see them, hey, remember how stupid you were? Right. Give them space. I mean, just look at how you, you were, you said this and I saw it too. After that Wednesday, after last Wednesday, I saw a lot of people who had voted for Trump suddenly looking around like they had just woken up from a really bad dream and thinking, whoa, what in the world just happened? And how did I get here? And how was I complicit? Yeah. But then in a very short amount of time, they were able to switch that narrative because people started going after them, started attacking them. And that moment of vulnerability disappeared because they were being attacked for other things they felt. And so they began to circle those wagons again. They started getting going into defense mode. Yeah. And so we've got to try not to rub the salt in people's wounds while still holding them accountable for what they've done but once they've shown true contrition and you know part of it is celebrities don't get true consequences i mean think about i mean i think about this often mel gibson how many times has he been allowed back into polite society after saying some crazy thing right and you know as a christian i totally believe in forgiveness but they're are some things that the Bible says if a pastor does them, they can't be a pastor. Right. That doesn't mean I don't forgive them if they did that sin to me or someone I know. That doesn't mean God doesn't forgive them. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't forgive them. But that also, just because we forgave them, doesn't mean we say, oh, okay, you can be a pastor again. No. That doesn't work that way. There's some things that disqualify you from leadership. Yeah. There are definitely some things that disqualify you from leadership. And what about restoration? I mean, on the other side of that, you, you, you know, you yeah. have, let's say, you know, Ben Sass, I don't know where Ben Sass stands, somebody like him who seems to understand what's right and wrong in all this situation, but to win reelection in the primaries was quiet and has yeah. sort of gone along to get along somewhat. And now he's showing contrition Yeah, a- and you kind of go, well, I I sort of believe the guy because he's showing some courage, but he doesn't have a lot of courage. And I don't, you know, it's, 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 it's almost like somebody who's kind of can't, can't get out of the cycle, right? Like can't, can't kick it. How do you deal with somebody like that? I think it, a lot depends on how complicit they were partly, you know, every person's different. And that's what we've got to realize every single person in the, you know, it's as libertarians, we often have a problem with, oh, it's just the government, the government's evil, the the government's full of individual. There's a theory I learned about in various libertarian podcasts, I believe I heard about it first on the Tom Woods podcast called um, public choice theory. Mm -hmm. And it's basically applying the idea of free market and incentives to the government. So people in the government are going to do what they're incentivized to do. And right now, the way things are, all that power, because we, and it's not even, I mean, I'm not, we have allowed the government to have so much power in our lives. You know, Tricia sometimes says, I don't have, I'm my own president. Because she's saying, I'm not going to let the government control my life. And you know what? Yeah, the government's powerful in some ways. 
but we need to stop letting them control our life. Stop worrying about them as much. Start focusing on what we can control. I can control myself. I can control what I do with other people, how I treat other people. I can't control Ben Sass. And we need to stop putting so much faith in our politicians because politicians are going to politician. Right. I mean, that, that's a part of the game. Yeah. And I'm sort of using these people as avatars because I think there's a lot of, um, yeah. there's a lot of parallels in human behavior in some of these stories that people are more familiar with, you know, it's hard yeah. for me to talk about, you know, uncle bill and yeah my, my my aunt Susie and the things i'm having struggles with there i mean so so in terms of mercy you know as we kind of bring it home i know you've thought a lot about this and yeah. and have prepared a little bit i mean what are some other things what are some other thoughts on mercy that we ought to be thinking about well one other parable that keeps popping into my my mind is the parable of the unjust servant do you remember that one mm -hmm. where um, Nobody knows the Bible better than me. My favorite is <laughs> Corinthians 2. No, he said 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. <laughs> <laughs> 2 Corinthians. But the, the unjust servant was this guy who owed his master, his, master, his, uh, you know, his boss, a huge amount of money. Um, it was an insane amount of money, more money than a normal person in that time could have ever made in a lifetime. And the, and the boss just forgave him of that debt. And then he went and found a, a friend, a, a, a co-worker who owed him like a day's wages. So say 200 bucks. And he threw him in debtor's prison over that debt. And then the, the, the boss man came back, found out about it. And he threw the original guy back in prison because he said, look, I forgave you this huge debt and you couldn't forgive him that tiny little debt. And that's something we need to think about in our lives. Think about all the things that we, you know, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. We've all made mistakes. We've all done stupid things. But we can show people mercy. And part of learning how to show people mercy is just get to know them. Get yeah. to know their struggles. Get to know their difficulties. One thing that really helped me in my journey was going outside of my box. Like literally, I started trying to listen to political perspectives I disagreed with, not so I could get some ammo, not so I could figure out what those crazy people are saying, but so that I could understand how they were thinking so I could understand why they think the way they do. Not even for ammo, but just so that I could empathize with them. And I think that's what we need because most people don't believe, the things that they believe, the things that they want, they're, it's not because they're evil. They want to get everybody. They think what they believe is virtuous. Yeah, most people, I think, act for, and, and I really try hard in the show to illustrate this, to, to show people how I do it, because I really try hard at it. Like, I don't like Trump, and I don't like what he's turned a lot of people into, and no. I know that that comes across in the show, but, like, when the, when the Capitol took place, I, I tried hard not to just buy into they're all domestic terrorists. They yeah. all hundred thousand people need to go to jail. All 47 million people are terrorists. Like, I think that's just dishonest and not doesn't work. Like it's not merciful. It's not no. graceful. Like you, you, you have to look at it. Like when you dig in the people that are there are there for their perfectly rational reasons to them in their reality. Yeah, in the reality you know, they're living in. People who go to Black Lives Matter events. Are, now, there is no equivalent between people who are trying to be unoppressed by <laughs> police officers in the state versus people who are there exercising their rights based on the lies of a con man. Like, they're, they're, yeah. not, a, they're not equivalents, but I understand why the the people at the capitol some of them were there some of them were there because they believe violence is the right action like i yeah. think those people des deserve to be in jail right like um mm -hmm. and and in that case like the person who kills the cop at the capitol that person deserves mercy and that they get due process and a trial yes 
not mercy is not letting them go free mercy is yeah. giving them the benefit of the doubt to explain themselves and then giving the consequences based on the facts but the, yeah and th but that's also a protection for everyone else as well right but unfortunately because so many people are denied that they feel justified in not wanting to give that to him that person right there's a lot of people who go I'm sorry you feel like a minority for the first time in your life, but I don't have a lot of sympathy because of what you've done to me. Yeah. And it once again, we just have to start. We need to take the step, even when people have wronged us individually, when individuals have wronged me, I need to take the step of reaching out to them and showing them love and mercy, even if they don't deserve it in my head. Because the only way we're going to ratchet this down is if individuals start talking to each other. If individuals start showing each other mercy, I can't show mercy to the whole country. I can't do it because I, I, I don't have the, the capacity to do that because I'm just one man. All I can do is show mercy to the people in my lives. Well, let me put it in libertarian party context, yeah. right? So like Amash says this thing about, he, he's defining terms between anarchists and libertarians and it pissed all the anarchists off. Yeah. Well, there isn't a day that goes by as a minarchist that I'm not told by some anarchist that I'm not a real libertarian. And so when all the anarchists start screaming about someone saying they're not a real libertarian, I didn't really have a lot of sympathy because now you're experiencing for the first time what I experience every single day, having yeah. a difference of opinion. You people have decided you are the libertarians and, and decided that I'm not. And so I didn't particularly care, but I had to admit to people like Hody and Trisha, I get it. I understand yeah. because I understand how you're feeling, but I want you to understand that's how I feel every day, mm -hmm. you know, and vice versa. Like, I'm not a huge fan of the Mises caucus. I'm not going to get into it. Uh, but we have a couple people, specifically Donald Thompson of the Mises caucus that comes in and pushes back. And I've grown to respect that caucus more because Donald takes the vulnerable position of being in our Facebook group and being an honest broker and saying, Hey, that's not cool. Or why don't, why do you think that way? Like what, you know, we have arguments, Yeah. but I, but I respect him a lot. I respect Justico Mistral and Austin Broderson and mm -hmm. these people that are there. I don't respect the people that are there that inflame and then bounce and post yeah. the screenshots in that group. I respect the person who's there going, all right, Spangle, I know you're not trying to be a jerk, but you're being a jerk. Yeah. Explain yourself. That guy holds me accountable and I really appreciate it, but he's doing hard work and, and, you know, putting himself in a rough position and it's paid off with me because I've softened my heart. Yeah. Well, People part of that, you, me as an opponent. Part of that, and that that you just gave me, reminded me of something I've ranted about in various places, but we need to stop assuming the worst in everybody we don't like. Yeah. Because, you know, just because someone tweets something, don't just jump to the assumption that it's going, oh, he's definitely talking about this one thing. You know, I mean, there was this big controversy over a specific tweet that happened where someone made a generic statement. He didn't mention names. He didn't mention events or anything like that. He just made a generic statement. And a bunch of people said, oh, you're talking about this particular thing. Yeah, let's be fair. Dave Smith said something and it was tone deaf for the moment, but it wasn't what he was talking about. And people assumed the absolute worst interpretation yeah. of it. I and wasn't sure if we wanted to name it's it okay. because I'm, I'm not attacking him at all no 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 i'm i'm sticking up for him saying like they should have done what julie borowski did which was at him and ask him what he meant so he could explain it before yeah. the outrage like if he had come back and said no 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 i meant the worst interpretation of this <laughs> yeah then be mad at the person but don't take the vague statement that is because most people when they're online are th giving like three quarters of a thought towards the thing that's going into their thumbs. Yeah. 
and a and person who hosts a podcast is absolutely no different than than you yeah. you know and so, so give we, people the benefit of the doubt instead yeah, always of always assume on. the best in what they say sometimes that's harder than it can <laughs> some people don't give you a lot of room to do that yeah but when someone says something ambiguous don't jump to the automatic worst conclusion of what they're saying give them the benefit of the doubt because you know what if you do and they push back they'll prove who they are yeah i'd say like nick sarwark if people just stop jumping to the worst conclusions about nick and dave and screenshotting their tweets and being outraged at them imagine how much further ahead we'd be yeah and it <laughs> wasn't know, give, even give some like if you are a mises caucus person give nick some mercy if you're a faker tarian give some mercy and grace to dave like yeah. I, you know i just feel like those are some practical online examples you know if you are if you are a progressive liberal and your uncle starts some crap just keep moving just keep scrolling yeah. don't engage like just go i'm going to be merciful and not drop some knowledge on this fool you know, and part of it is you, you have to look at the circumstances and the context of where he's saying it and what's doing. If someone says something crazy on Facebook, someone you know, and they've got like one like and no comments on it, you starting something is going to platform him. It's actually yeah. going to increase the reach of what he said. If you really want to talk to him about it, talk to him about it in private so that you're not giving what he said a voice that's a good that's a good point like private message someone and go hey what did you mean by this you know yeah. did you ever think because I, I know that happens a lot where somebody will message me and go hey do you realize the context of what you just said and i'll go absolutely not i did not mean it that way yeah you know and and, and like that just happened there was some article i think it was cnn and somebody said and this is a great example of it like some op-ed on CNN said that they wanted Republicans cleansed or Trump people cleansed out of the Republican Party. And like somebody pointed out like, hey, maybe that's going to trigger people who have a victim complex who think that they're about to be killed by the left. Yeah. Maybe you shouldn't use the word cleansed because of it. And they <laughs> updated the language to mean, you know, and what, what, what do you mean? Out or whatever. What do you mean by a Trump supporter? Right. You know, there's 76 million people who voted for Trump. But did every single one of them vote for Trump because they were a diehard Trumper or a white supremacist? And did every single person who voted for Biden do so because they were 100 percent on board with everything Biden believes in and, and is going to do? No. We're making choices based on faulty information. All of us, every single one of us makes choices based on faulty information. Well, I don't know that we've solved the world. I, I know this is this is an example of the conversation that we have in our chat all the time with each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we definitely have our own perspectives and we definitely have our own like, you know, I'm thinking a lot about how I've handled things and thinking about it, doing them differently. But mercy is something that I think Vaughn is like at the top of our list in our group chat as we're doing public commentary like how can we be empathetic understanding and merciful of other people even when we don't want to <laughs> <laughs> oh it's it's hard and but but you know if we show mercy to the other person in that facebook group in that facebook argument you know you're getting into it with this person but when you show them mercy then you're if there's redemption if there's a possibility to for redemption you've given them a path i guess the way to put it is each of us have the the ability to confirm the worst fears of the other person or not yeah but if they're a bad actor and we're showing them mercy and we're trying to give them the benefit of the doubt they'll reveal themselves for who they are we don't have to show everyone who they are if we act if we do what we need to do, if we treat them the way we should be treating them, then we don't have to worry about, oh, but if I don't denounce them and say they're horrible, horrible people, no one will know. Trust me, people will figure it out. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Like, you don't need to be the judge, jury, executioner. Like, you be the reasonable voice 
right and let the crazies reveal themselves for who they are right all right von sparger thank you so much for joining me i appreciate it we're going to have you back on to talk about some more other fundamental concepts and how they apply uh because mm -hmm. like i said i mean my religion is something that i've not talked a lot about here just because i don't want people to feel uncomfortable but i kind of don't care anymore about people's comfort <laughs> and i feel like there are these these concepts that inform my politics that you know you don't have to be a christian to understand and practice mercy no you know it's 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 an important concept that i think our world is hungry for and uh i thank you for helping articulate it a little bit all right Thank you for listening to The Chris Spangle Show here on the We Are Libertarians Network, and we will see you again soon.